Doctor, thanks for joining us today. We're talking about bug bites and, and, uh, and seasonal insect bites, and it's that time of year in Texas. Where's the first question? When is a mosquito bite something I need to be concerned about? Um, you need to become concerned about mosquito bites when they become red hot or the surrounding area becomes firm, what we call cellulitis. That's usually a secondary infection from mosquito bites. Mosquitoes are the, are the vector, the transmitting agent of West Nile virus. What are the symptoms of West Nile and how do you treat it? Mosquitoes do transmit all kinds of diseases, uh, including malaria back when they were building the Panama Canal. West Nile is common in our area and it's a uh, viral disease causing general fevers, aches, uh, nausea, uh, fatigue, it's a viral syndrome. It can cause headaches and can lead to meningitis. And how is it treated? Uh, it's really treated symptomatically. Um, we don't have any magic cure for a viral illness. Uh, the danger is, is if a person develops a uh, meningitis symptom and starts having vomiting and not taking in fluids, change subject. Let's change, let's change varmints. Let's okay. talk about ticks. What's the best way to remove a tick if you find one attached? Um, the best way to remove a tick is with a fine pair of tweezers uh, and you have to get real low and get the head which is probably attached by two little pincher jaws. Uh, it is not correct just to grab the body and pull the tick. Is there a likelihood, and if so, how great a likelihood is there of contracting uh, Lyme's disease from having a tick? Lyme's disease is not very common in our area. Um, it can be contracted. It's much more common in the Northeast and up in the Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin area. A tick has to be attached for two to three days in order for the infecting spirochete to invade the body and to become infected. So if you find a tick, remove it promptly, your incidence of Lyme disease is very low. For those that are unfamiliar, what is Lyme disease? Uh, Lyme's disease is a spirochete infection. It usually presents with a rash, a uh, red bullseye type rash around the bite. Uh, it can develop into other stages of disease. There's actually three stages of Lyme's disease. It can develop a chronic arthralgia or joint pain, uh, which is one of the bad symptoms. Uh, if it's not treated early and you develop these chronic symptoms, you have them for life. Let's go to spiders. In this part of the world, how common are brown recluse and black widow spiders? Um, I would say that spiders get a bad rap these days. Uh, most people come in with small abscesses or infections, risins, say, well, I got a spider bite, and that's usually not the case. Um, we do have both brown recluse and black widow spiders in our area, uh, but bites are not common. Let's say you get one anyway. What are the symptoms of a spider bite? Um, that's really a two-fold question because you're dealing with two different species and the reaction to the bite is very different. Uh, a brown recluse causes a local reaction and swelling which then can later develop tissue necrosis. Uh, the classic finding is like a volcano where the center of the bite starts to go down and become black and necrotic with raised humps around let's it. Just, let's define necrotic. Necrotic is dead tissue. Okay. Uh, necrosis is dead or dying tissue. So the center of it, it, it rises up like a mountain and then the center part falls down like a volcano as the tissue starts to die. And that's for a brown recluse Correct. bite. Okay. And contrast that to a black widow. A black widow is a venomous bite. Uh, the black widow has the classic red hourglass um, and the venom is a neurotoxin that causes muscle cramps. Uh, it can cause severe sweating, uh, restlessness, 
sometimes mistaken for acute appendicitis or heart attack because people come in with such severe pain and cramping in their muscles. Let's say I don't know what bit me, I just know that, that it's getting worse. What do I do and when do I go to the emergency room? Um, first you want to wash the area very well, <clears throat> soap and water. Uh, applying ice is good for any acute bite. Um, you can also use things like uh, topical steroids, 1% hydrocortisone cream is over the counter. Uh, if there's itching associated with it, you can use uh, calamine lotion locally or you can use Benadryl capsules by mouth. Um, when a spite becomes, if you have any bite that has systemic symptoms, meaning general throughout the body, uh, generalized rash, generalized fever, generalized nausea, vomiting, that's the time you need to see a doctor. So that would be the time maybe to show up at the ER. You betcha. Very, very well. Let's just hope to avoid all of this. What are some practical tips for avoiding insect and spider bites to begin with? Um, number one, I would say avoid their habitat. You know, if you don't need to be out in the woods, stay out of the woods. Uh, some people who do yard work and have to clear brush are, are going to be much more exposed to that. If you have to be outside, I'd recommend long sleeve shirts, long pants, tall socks, shoes that cover your toes. Uh, that can get hot in the summertime, so it's important to drink plenty of water, but you need to keep your skin surfaces covered. Let's talk about repellents. Which ones work best and do they work on all insects and bugs? Uh, the best repellents now are DEET, D-E-E-T, which is diethylene uh, tolamide. Um, is that something you're not going to see that as the brand name? You're going to see that in the ingredients. It is an ingredient. Right. Um, and it comes in different concentrations, and it is a repellent for mosquitoes. Uh, it does not repel spiders or stinging insects, wasps, bees, uh, that type of thing. The only danger with DEET is in small children, uh, I would advise not letting them apply it because they'll get it on their hands and can put it in their eyes or their mouth. DEET or uh, any type of insect repellent is for skin use only. Right. It's not for mucosa, pink moist surfaces, eyes, conjunctivitis. Very well. Last thing, bee stings, wasp stings. Are they similar? Do you treat them similarly? Or are they different? Bee stings and wasp stings are very different. Uh, bees, honey bees, have a stinger, one stinger which when they sting generally becomes attached. It has a little fish hook end. The danger is is if you grab the stinger with the tweezers to pull it out you can actually inject more venom in so removing of a bee stinger should be done with the edge of a credit card or a sharp surface and scraped sideways and not squeezed. Um, hornets, yellow jackets, wasps have a stinger that can repeatedly inject you. Uh, so it's not a stinger that comes off. It's more like a pin that can shoot, shoot, shoot. What's the likelihood of uh, anaphylaxis, of, of uh, you know, an allergic reaction to wasps and bees? Um, I don't have a specific percentage for you. I'm going to guess probably in the neighborhood of 1% uh, have severe anaphylactic reactions. Anaphylaxis is a term that we use for a drop in blood pressure, an increase in heart rate. Usually when that happens, the person becomes weak, dizzy, falls to the ground. Very well. Thanks for your time today, Doctor. Hey, you're very welcome.